Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Samuel Bowles. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we've tried for a while because your work has fascinated me for a very long time. Let me talk a little about your background. You have a doctorate in economics from Harvard. You're the director of the behavioral of the behavioral science program at the Santa Fe Institute here in Santa Fe. You're also a professor of econ at the University of Siena in Italy, professor emeritus in eco economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. You come trailing clouds of economic glory. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be here. <laughs> they say that, that economics is called the dismal science, but your work is so interesting. I just want to show your latest book. We'll come back and talk about it, but this one is called A Cooperative Species, and the subtitle? Human reciprocity and its evolution. Aha. Uh -huh. But you didn't just fall into this out of nowhere. Talk a little about your early work at Harvard and tell us a little about your relationship with Martin Luther King and how you got started in the line of inquiry that you have followed. Well, I guess you could say that I was a dismal scientist. I was uh, a very bland economist teaching standard things uh, to my graduate students at Harvard. And I didn't much like the way economics uh, was going, um, but I didn't know what I could do about it until I got a request from Martin Luther King uh, asking for a bunch of background papers to try to explain some of the problems of poverty and inequality in America. Well, this is why I'd gone to graduate school in the first place, to study things like that, uh, and I wished they had a larger place in economics. So a group of us agreed that we would write a series of papers for Reverend King. Uh, and for me, it was intoxicating because it gave me the opportunity to use all the economics which I had learned uh, to answer a question put to me by Dr. Martin Luther King. Now that's a pretty, uh, uh, it'd be pretty hard to say no to that uh, question. And I realized that I could really do a different kind of economics, and I realized that I could study inequality and social justice using the tools of economics. And so I really had to thank King for setting me off on a different road. And so he was inquiring you for your uh, intellectual guidance uh, in his next step in his social justice campaign. He was then preparing for the Poor People's March, uh, which uh, would have occurred uh, uh, just after his death, he was killed shortly thereafter. Uh, and of course, it was a great tragedy for the world. Uh, but for me, he had already uh, changed the course of my life. Well, you almost changed the course of his life. <laughs> Tell <laughs> well, us what happened. Well, I'm a bit ashamed about this. Uh, I had known King before because I'd worked with him in the anti-Vietnam War uh, movement. And uh, he had agreed to come uh, uh, to Massachusetts and do some door-to-door uh, canvassing, uh, and uh, we were trying to promote the idea that uh, this is something that we should do. And I was taking him from one place to the other. Um, I'd been discussing my interest as a young man uh, in Buddhism because I had gone to school in India. And uh, I think I was distracted by, how, uh, by being in a car with Martin Luther King, I suppose. And I drove right in front of an onrushing bus. And fortunately, the bus driver was paying attention, even though I w wasn't. And we barely missed uh, crashing on the passenger side where Dr. King was sitting. And uh, I was, of course, very shaken. And we went on uh, silently for a couple of minutes. And then he said to me very quietly, young man, you certainly don't drive nonviolently. <laughs> But as a youth in India, y you, you couldn't help but, as a child growing up, seeing the inequality there. Well, the thing that struck me so much when I was a kid in India, I was there when I was in junior high school, and I went to a school, I was, my sisters and I were the only uh, kids who weren't from India in the school, and uh, it was a very primitive school. It didn't have buildings, it had tents. And uh, I, uh, I noticed uh, something very striking, which is that almost everybody in India was poor. And I came from a town on the East Coast in which there were a couple of poor families. I knew them well because we all went to school together. Uh, but uh, there was a reason for their hard luck. Uh, and uh, 
uh, we kind of understood why they weren't getting on so well. But in India, you have whole regions uh, and uh, millions of people who are uh, poor. And I remember once coming home from school and reflecting to my mom, I, I said, uh, listen, uh, I'm not very good at school here compared to the other kids, and I'm not any better in sports, and the other kids don't like me any better, and how come if I'm so average, Americans are so much richer than Indians? And uh, she gave me some answer. I didn't think it was very convincing at the time, but it's probably more than anything else the reason why I decided to study economics, which was to try to figure out why it is that people who all around the world are just about the same have such different fortunes in terms of the kinds of resources they have and the kinds of things they can do with their lives. Um, and it's, uh, as I said, having studied economics, I don't think I learned exactly what I needed, but with Dr. King's help, I set off on a different course, and it served me well ever since. Well, what you found, we have a lot of myths about equality and inequality, and, and there's the American dream, rags to riches, and, and you've written about uh, those that are born poor, there's a, probably a 30% chance that they're going to remain poor all of their life. Those that are born wealthy, will, there's a 33% chance, that, or you know, closely, that they will uh, achieve the same standard of living that their family had or their parents had, and that there's only a 1.3% chance of somebody from the lower tenth economically to rise to the upper tenth. That is not go west, young man, rags to riches at all. And yet, people, it's not a question of IQ, it's not a question of education, it's a question of choosing your parents. Yeah, some people have bad luck when it comes to parents, I guess you could say, um, when it comes to their wealth and when it comes to the kind of resources they can afford for their schooling and their health and so on. Um, yes, that's, I, I think that the idea that America is distinctively a land of opportunity is, um, is a big myth. Uh, and uh, there are many democratic things about American culture. I mean, it's not every culture in which the elite also wears blue jeans. Uh, but if you look behind the blue jeans, you'll notice that in the briefcases, there are vastly different resources than you'd find in the lunch boxes of other people who do normal work or try to make ends meet in office work and so on. Uh, but that's, I mean, I think that's one of the two big myths about inequality in America. And the second one is that we need this inequality because it helps the economy work better, uh, that it provides incentives. Uh, and uh, that's why the American economy works so well. And I'm happy to say that in recent years, economists have discovered that the reverse is probably true. But generations of people were trained in economics that inequality, inequality of wealth, inequality of pay, is, the, uh, is necessary to grease the wheels of economic progress. And only recently has pe have people begun to realize that it's more like sand in the gears of economic progress. It really slows things down. And the real wake-up call for economists was a very simple thing. I'm so surprised no one did it sooner. If it's true that high levels of inequality is important for a rapidly growing economy, why didn't we just compare the economies that are relatively more equal uh, in terms of wealth and, in and income with the countries that are pretty unequal? Well, such a comparison jumps off the page in the world because the Latin American countries, most of them are extraordinarily unequal, and the East Asian countries, most of them are extraordinarily equal. So suppose you wanted to compare, uh, say, Singapore, Taiwan, Korea with uh, Argentina, Chile, uh, Colombia. Uh, well, there you'd have it. Uh, the three Latin American countries are extraordinarily unequal with very entrenched elites uh, earning uh, hundreds of times what ordinary people uh, earn. And those economies have grown much, much more slowly than what are called the Asian tigers because of their economic success. Well, when economists started to think about that, we started to discover all kinds of reasons why it is that an economy which was structured with a lot of inequality would be wasting resources in lots of ways. Well, um, if, if we were to rank the nations, so I think Sweden is number one in terms of the smallest gap between the rich and the poor. Sweden and Denmark and Norway are all very equal. And the least equal? The least equal of the, uh, in the world are probably Brazil, South Africa, uh, setting aside very small countries. But the U.S. is in the competition for being a very unequal country. 
and that's what people are saying. The gap between the rich or the haves and the have-nots is so dramatic, getting so dramatic. Yeah, it's growing in America. It's also growing in many countries. Uh, uh, there was a long period of decline in inequality in America and also other countries, which was reversed in the last quarter of a century. Now, just one thing, because I want to get on to how we got that way, but you have said that, that there's something called guard labor. That Tell us what that is. Well, guard labor is a term that Arjun Jayadev and I have uh, used to describe all of the um, all of the people in an economy that are not producing goods and services. They're just, they have jobs which are, what can we say, keeping the lid on. These are the private security personnel. These are the armed forces. These are the police officers. Uh, these are the people who are trying to keep the thing going more or less in an orderly way. Uh, they're not actually producing the stuff that we eat and wear and ride around in. Um, and uh, included are, for example, prison guards, uh, and uh, also um, uh, we could include judicial personnel uh, in criminal courts and so on. But even it extends even to the person in a business office that makes sure that you're not surfing the internet on work time. A absolutely. And that all the paper clips stay at the office and don't go home. Yeah, we have vast arrays of work cops in America, far greater than other countries. Uh, these are people who have supervisory positions, and their main task is trying to basically uh, maintain the property rights of the firm, as, as you put it. Now, um, the, this kind of work is absolutely essential to any society. I'm not suggesting that guard labor is somehow not necessary. My son-in-law is a, is a prison guard, and I'm very proud of his work, and it's a very necessary kind of work. However, we have to ask, why in America do we have so much of this compared to other countries? And you say that perhaps it's as much as one in four yes, of American workers is involved in yes, this Yes, that's approximately the right estimate. One in four. Yeah. Well, one in four are guarding the store. S so if that's where we are now, I want to come now to your book, A Cooperative Species, which you co-authored with Herbert Gintis? Yes, Herb Gintis has been my lifetime co-author. He was in the group uh, which responded to Reverend King's request uh, way back in 1968, and we've worked together ever since. Uh, the, um, uh, we got interested in this question of human behavior and uh, uh, human morals uh, because we noticed something uh, that was really the good news about inequality. And if the bad news about inequality is that inequality is increasing and that inequality doesn't work, it's not a way of greasing the wheels, the good news is that people don't like it. Um, people have extraordinarily strong negative reactions to people who act unjustly, either towards the person himself or herself, or even towards third parties. So um, we have done a large number of experiments, and there have been many more experiments with uh, substantial sums of money at stake, dividing up sums of money, in which it's very clear that people, uh, a very large fraction of people, are fair-minded when it comes to dividing up things. And much more important, if they see somebody who's not acting fairly, they're willing to take money out of their own pocket so as to dock their payoffs. Uh, it means that people are willing to pay for justice. Uh, and this is big news. Uh, now, this is the kind of thing that you know people say that uh, people are naturally good, and this sometimes comes from religious fi uh, figures and uh, sometimes from other social sciences, such as sociology, anthropology. But it's big news when it's coming out of economics itself that the idea of selfishness is actually way overplayed as a human motive. Uh, we're not uniformly selfish. We're a complicated species, and we have a lot of people who, a lot of the time, act in altruistic ways. Well, I want to applaud the scholarship and the research that was gone, because this is not only text. There's a lot of formulas in here. So you go back how far back, and then how do you measure? Uh, the whole thing is the tension between altruism and selfishness. How do you measure in an, in an ancient society altruism? They are dead and gone. What's left? What do you have to, how, what do you base your research on? Uh, we know a lot about how humans lived 50 or 100,000 years ago because we're quite sure what they ate, 
uh, and we know how they had to survive by eating what they ate. Uh, that is, they hunted and gathered. Uh, they hunted large animals, uh, and they also gathered fruits and tubers and so on. Now think about hunting large animals. These large animals uh, have an extraordinary amount of calories. Uh, the ones shown on the cover of my book uh, probably have about a third of a million edible calories. Uh, and suppose you caught one. Remember, it's hot in Africa, and that's where our ancestors came from. And you catch one of these things and you kill it. Are you going to sit on top of it and try to monopolize the meat from that animal? Well, uh, it wouldn't be uh, uh, very sensible to do that. And besides, the stuff would rot before you could eat it. Moreover, your friends would probably take it from you. Uh, and so our ancestors found ways of sharing these very large packages of meat, which they very occasionally got. So if I was a lucky hunter one day, uh, I, I, I might not get anything for a month. And by the way, that's a fact, not just an example. That's about what it would be like. Um, I hunted with uh, hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, and not surprisingly, we got absolutely nothing. Uh, now, they needed an insurance scheme. They needed a social safety net, and they figured out how to do it. And how to do it is, I share my meat with you, you share your meat with, uh, with me. Uh, they have sometimes a common pot way of redistribution, which is, all the big stuff that comes in, whether it's meat or large caches of honey, gets distributed e equally. Uh, and I mean equally. I mean, I was very skeptical when I first heard this, but I've seen it myself. We, because we didn't catch any animals, but we did gather a huge amount of honey with the Hadza people in Tanzania. And I was amazed at how many people showed up from distant bands coming a long way just to have, just to eat their heart out. I mean, they consumed, they must have had horrible headaches when they finished, <laughs> uh, but they consumed a massive amount of honey, just sharing it equally with everybody. Uh, now, the, the, uh, 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 there, there's a lot of skepticism uh, when people, when this uh, behavior became well documented by quantitative anthropologists. And the question in back of everybody's mind is, look, natural selection is a harsh process. It's a process which rewards people who are successful in gathering enough resources together so that they can have more kids than anybody else. That's how natural selection works. Now, the altruist would help somebody else hunt, uh, or the altruist who would give away the meat which he got, would seem to be doomed by natural selection. And so the real task in this book, and that's why there's some mathematical models and computer simulations, as well as archaeology and genetics and uh, other facts about how our ancient ancestors lived, uh, the real question is to try to figure out, would it be possible for a natural selection to produce a cooperative species? And we came up with a pretty convincing answer, I think. Well, this is one of the biggest questions of of our world is the nature of man good or bad is which is stronger altruism or selfishness and so if you can look around our world today we've been through decades of greed is good what about me I got mine dog eat dog so there's a Darwinism survival of the fittest strain and then there's this other the the cooperative model so talk to me about the dialectic between those two well, you know, I think it's a ma mistake to say that um, uh, na that uh, human nature is either X or Y. Uh, what we find in our experiments is everywhere, and we've done these all over the world, including in the Amazon and in Africa among hunters and gatherers, as well as with economics majors at Caltech and so on. We've really, we have a huge uh, sample pool uh, and what we find is that in these experiments, there are some people who are systematically selfish. They figure out how the game goes, and they figure out how to maximize their payoffs. Uh, there's some people who are unconditionally nice. They just give stuff away, even if somebody's exploiting them. Uh, there's some people who are these reciprocators, and that's what our book is about, who are generous, but they won't tolerate being exploited, and they won't tolerate anyone exploiting anyone else. Uh, so. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I mean, what we found out in the experiments is that, by the way, the selfish ones are always a minority, and in some cases quite small, like a third or maybe a fifth. Uh, and the other types, which are not entirely selfish or not uniformly so, uh, make up the vast majority of these populations. And, you know, it's not surprising. Uh, if you think about what's happening in the world, what has happened in the world, uh, of course they're selfish people, and of course there seems to be 
in America in the last 20 years or so, a kind of celebration of wealth and uh, an indifference sometimes towards the uh, concerns of uh, ordinary people who are trying to make ends meet. But let's step back a bit. The American people regularly vote for governments that enact programs that mean they pay taxes to help other people who are less lucky than themselves. And that happens all over the world. And that's not going away. Um, or think about, think about the kinds of people who have made America what it is. Think about the civil rights workers who were assassinated, to whom we dedicate our book. Uh, these are people who have decided they believe in something higher than themselves. And there are a lot of people like that out there. And I don't think for a minute that the majority of people in America are selfish uh, all the time uh, or anywhere else in the world. I mean, you find these surprising things like the Arab Spring, these democratic movements throughout the Middle East, coming in a place where people had said for years they'll never be democratic. There is something about Islam which is necessarily undemocratic. And then all of a sudden, people had to open their eyes and notice that Muslim people, like people all around the world, are predisposed to hate injustice and to hate being controlled. Uh, we've spoken about this before, but one of my favorite things about the, the, the Jasmine Revolution in Egypt was after days of demonstration in, in Tiberia Square, and it was just a mess, the people were, they spent a whole day just cleaning it. They scrubbed the graffiti, they put all the cobblestones back, and people would say, well, why are you doing this? Because they said, this is our square. This is our land. We are Egypt, and we want to do this. Well, the hearts of moms all over the world, you know, <laughs> went pitter pat because, you know, we really understood why how they'd taken ownership and were really trying to, to make it all better. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the important part of that is that they had these predispositions that if they were the owner of it, then they would damn well take care of it. And I think we should take that lesson to our workplaces and our offices as well. That is, if people don't feel they have ownership of the things they're producing, you're not going to get a job well done. Uh, and we have to think about that. Once we take on board the fact that people have intrinsic motives to do well, they have ethical commitments which would lead them to reciprocate an employer's goodwill and an employer's generosity and so on. If those things are mobilized, we can do anything. And if those things are trashed, then I think we'll just have a garrison economy, uh, one in which we have as many guards as we have people producing stuff. You end the book with uh, the, uh, the future of cooperation, and you have a wonderful image there. Uh, I don't want to get too technical, but Adam Smith has this theory of the invisible hand. But tell us how you work that with the future of cooperation. Well, um, uh, uh, as everyone knows, I think, the invisible hand was a very catchy phrase used by the economist Adam Smith in 1776 to begin uh, advocating a um, free enterprise economy. And he, it was a remarkable idea, and it was substantially correct in the way he put it, uh, that competition among profit-seeking firms and among individuals seeking the best deal for themselves would lead to many beneficial effects. Um, now, it often fails. Uh, modern economics has shown the many ways that it fails. And of course, it fails in those areas such as environmental destruction. It fails in areas where the things which we would like to write a contract in, like knowledge, or I can promise to repay my loan, but you can't enforce it if I'm broke, or I probably can't write a contract with you that I'll work hard for you, because who could define what works hard? And you probably can't collect back wages from me if I didn't work hard. So what economists have discovered is that they're all there's lots of areas in the economy in which the kinds of contracts on which Adam Smith relied to organize our life just don't work. Uh, there's a term for it. It's called a market failure. And where markets fail, uh, we have to trust that people are going to step in and they're going to do a good job not because they're afraid of getting fired, but because they trust their uh, fellow workers, they feel some reciprocity towards their boss, they like the work, uh, they feel proud of it, uh, and so on. Um, and this means we have to be able to make agreements uh, in a cooperative way. Um, and the kind of thing that you can't really enforce by lawyers, but you can make very likely to happen by eye contact. And so at the end of the book, I said, where the invisible hand fails, the handshake may succeed. And we're entering an economy today in which we're going to need a lot more handshakes, uh, we're because we're entering an economy in which contracts are not going to get the job done all by themselves. Uh, now, 
The big challenge for us, of course, is this. A handshake-based economy cannot be an unequal economy. Because if you want to have the trust, if you want to have, I'll put myself in your shoes, I'll do a good job for you, that's not going to happen if the person you're dealing with is making 100 times what you're making. You just aren't going to feel that way. And by the way, that individual's probably not going to feel that way towards you either. Uh, so uh, if we want to have an economy which is based on trust, uh, commitment, intrinsic desire to do a good job, uh, and ethical responsibility, I don't think it can be as unequal as where America is going today. I want to extrapolate into the world of politics because we know uh, the, the Western ethic of handshake business deals, but also handshake politicians that say, you know, I, I will do this for you if you elect me. Where do you see um, the political aspect of this uh, handshake uh, ethic? Well, I think. Um, I think we have to have a lot more confidence in voters than we've had in the past. Uh, I know people think, well, the voters are selfish and the voters are uninformed and so on. And I, I just don't, I don't get it. Um, I think when the voters are given a choice between doing good for someone else at a cost to themselves, they'll often go for it. Uh, I mean, the reason why some Americans don't like the so-called welfare state is not because they're selfish. It's because they perhaps mistakenly think that the welfare state is responsible for things which they don't think are moral or ethical. Uh, they think maybe it sponsors laziness. They perhaps haven't heard how hard you have to work if you're getting paid $10 an hour. So that, I mean, they're wrong about their beliefs. But I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a great insult to voters to think that people are just making, they're voting because of self-interest. I mean, think about this. If they really were self-interested, why did they vote in the first place? Because everyone knows that your vote is not going to decide the election. So, ah. so you actually take the time and go down and vote. So that's the very first wake-up call that maybe people are doing, they're voting because they're citizens. Now, I'm not happy with the way politics is going in a lot of aspects in America. But I don't think we can get around it by assuming that people are somehow uh, amoral or uh, um, have essentially um, uh, no moral or citizen-like commitments. I think they do. Well, I just uh, it reminds me of that quote that was attributed to Abe Lincoln, which is, when I do good, I feel good, and when I do bad, I feel bad. That's the basis of my religion. And, and I think that really Americans absolutely have that 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 ethic of wanting to do right and, and therefore they would be feeling good of, for doing right. But you've raised so many wonderful, wonderful ideas. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. I enjoyed being on your our, show. Our guest today is Samuel Bowles, with the Director of, of Human Behavior at the, is that right? The Be Behavioral Sciences. Behavioral Sciences at the Santa Fe Institute and author of this fascinating book, A Cooperative Species. So thank you for joining us. Thanks very much. And I'm Lorreen Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today and report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.